last thing we need living as we do in a greenhouse is more sources of heat. That however is precisely what we are contemplating both in terms of current energy practices as well as preferred proposals to address the climate problem. According to the fourth assessment report of the IPCC, 93.4% of the heat attributable to global warming has gone into the ocean. James Hansen comes up with a slightly different number, but what is important is the distribution of this heat, 80% near the surface and 14.7% in deeper waters. Some of the world's most lucrative fisheries have been based on cold water fish, which it stands to reason will be adversely impacted as the oceans warm. There are, however, many warm water species, and all else being equal, it would be reasonable to assume that these would thrive as their habitats expand. The ocean food chain is based on phytoplankton, which are also the lungs of the planet. Geologists believe for the first half of the Earth's history, the atmosphere contained virtually no oxygen. Oxygen only started accumulating about 2.4 billion years ago. Cyanobacteria were the first organisms to perform photosynthesis. No land plants were available to produce oxygen until almost 2 billion years after oxygen levels first began to rise in the atmosphere. It is evident, therefore, phytoplankton were the principal source of our oxygen-rich environment and to continue to supply about half of the oxygen we breathe. The source of the other half is also under significant threat due to climate change. A study led by Daniel Boyce of Dalhousie suggests phytoplankton stocks have declined significantly over the past half century. We are killing the base of the ocean's food chain at a rate of about 1% per year due to increasing ocean surface temperatures. What we think is happening is that the oceans are becoming more stratified as the water warms. The plants need sunlight from above and nutrients from below and as it becomes more stratified, that limits the availability of nutrients. Dr. Tim Parsons, a research scientist at the Institute of Ocean Sciences in Sydney, BC, hypothesizes that a volcanic eruption might have helped produce BC's largest sockeye salmon run since 1913. The 34 million salmon that returned to the Fraser in 2010 were adolescents in the Gulf of Alaska when the Kasachi volcano erupted in 2008. Dr. Parsons suggests the ash from the eruption fertilized the oceans, leading to a massive bloom of diatoms that are an unusually rich source of food for young sockeye. It has been suggested seeding the oceans with iron can draw down atmospheric CO2 levels by inducing the same kind of phytoplankton bloom. Others have pointed to the impracticality of such a proposal since it took a massive amount of iron to produce the bloom, which was short-lived. When these phytoplankton blooms die, they produce dead zones, as in the Gulf of Mexico, where the decay process sucks the oxygen out of the atmosphere. A satellite image of the Kasachi ash plume shows a close correlation with West Coast salmon migration patterns. An Icelandic eruption in 2010 caused a similar phytoplankton bloom in the Atlantic. Besides causing thermal stratification, a heated ocean expands and its expansion has nowhere to go but up onto our shoreline. Ice caps are being eroded by warming waters at their margins, and Dr. Yadu Pokerel led a study that recently found aquifer pumping has played a significant role in sea level rise in recent years, accounting for about 34% of the measured increase. Sea level rise projections, according to the IPCC, run to about one meter by the end of the century. Measurements by Martin Vermeer show how we are progressing along the projected path. James Hansen has projected sea level rise of as much as 5 meters by the end of the century, and a, and a study with Dr. Seiko points out that during the early Pliocene, where temperatures were only 1 degree centigrade warmer than today, sea levels were 25 meters higher. Other fisheries problems associated with global warming include growth cycles, Phytoplankton have started growth earlier in the season which affects the entire food chain. Migration, the warming of the oceans may also lead to migration of various species. Those that cannot adapt may die off. We are also changing the ocean's chemistry and acidity. Greater CO2 concentrations create increased ocean acidity which leads to phytoplankton reductions, which leads in turn to less uptake of greenhouse gases 
and less hot oxygen production. Acidification of the oceans also affects coral reefs and shellfish. Coral bleaching destroys fish food and habitat for great numbers of marine animals. Dr. Chung of the University of British Columbia recently suggested a decline in dissolved oxygen due to warming oceans will stunt fish growth. There is a common perception that if human societies make the significant adjustments necessary to substantively cut emissions of greenhouse gases, global temperature increases could be stabilized and the most dangerous consequences of climate change could be avoided. The study led by Gerald Meal shows that with aggressive mitigation in two of the scenarios, global average temperature increases could be stabilized either below 2 degrees centigrade or near 3 degrees centigrade of above pre-industrial level. With little mitigation, however, future sea level rise would be large and continue unabated for centuries. Even as temperatures stabilize, however, sea levels will continue to rise. The ocean is massive with an inertia to match. It is, sh it is slow to heat and will take a long time to cool even after we stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere. It will do this by coming back into equilibrium with the atmosphere, which will heat up as a consequence. According to a UVic UOC study, 4 meters of sea level rise is already built into the system over the next millennium. If Meal and others are correct, we have only started to see the detrimental impacts of climate change. The first law of thermodynamics states the increase in the internal energy of a system is equal to the difference between the increment of heat accumulated by the system and the increment of work done by it. What little effort there has been to address the climate problem so far has been focused on the left side of this equation. Slowing greenhouse gas accumulations, however, at best addresses only half of the problem. We are already living in a greenhouse. A NASA study determined the average amount of energy the ocean absorbed each year over the period 1993 to 2008 was en enough to power nearly 500 100 watt light bulbs for each of the roughly 6.7 billion people living on the planet. This 330 terawatts of power is about 20 times the amount of primary energy we consume every year. We can expect the oceans to continue to accumulate this kind of heat because even with complete elimination of CO2 emissions, atmospheric levels would only decrease by 40 parts per million over this century and this would have to decrease almost three times this amount to return to pre-industrial levels. Richard Smalley, a Nobel laureate in chemistry, suggested we may need as many as 60 terawatts of power every year by the year 2050 in order to, to satisfy a, a population of 10 billion. Half of that would be required to desalinate water. Many, including James Hansen and James Lovelock, suggest nuclear power as a solution to the warming problem. Others suggest fusion would be our energy nirvana. With either case, however, you still have to boil water to produce power, and this is only a 33% efficient operation. OTEC, at best, is about a tenth of that. To produce small 60 terawatts, you would produce an additional 120 watt terawatts of waste heat with either fission or fusion, and most of that would end up back in the ocean. Instead of adding 330 terawatts of already damaging heat to the oceans, you would now be adding 450 terawatts. With OTEC, on the other hand, you convert 60 terawatts of the damaging heat to productive use, and thus you only have 270 terawatts per year going to the ocean, which, although still a problem, is far superior to the other options. We have to short-circuit the left-hand side of the equation by converting some of this heat to productive work, and even then we'll have to reverse the right side of the equation once CO2 levels have decreased in order to reverse the da damage being done to the oceans. Going back to the stratification problem, we can see that we have both the largest hot reservoir as well as cold reservoir in existence on the planet in our oceans. These are precisely what is required to produce heat from a heat engine. Starting from the upper right, when you add heat to a column of gas, it expands. When you take the heat away, the gas continues to expand until it reaches an equilibrium pressure. Then you remove the heat at the lower left into a cold reservoir, 
and the column of gas shrinks. Take the cold reservoir away and it continues to collapse until it again reaches equilibrium. The center pressure volume diagram demonstrates the theoretical amount of work you can get out of the Carnot cycle, which equals the amount of heat you put in from the warm reservoir minus the amount of heat you extract from the cold. A calorie is the amount of heat produced by dropping a 427 kilogram weight in a gravity of 1 1 meter, which raises 1 liter of water by 1 degree centigrade. You get the same result by dropping 1 kilogram 427 meters. In the tropical latitudes, there are substantial expanses of oceans with a difference between the surface temperature and a depth of a 1,000 th meters is about 21 degrees. Mount Everest stands as a height of 8,850 meters. The efficiency of the Carnot engine is, is defined as 1 minus the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the warm reservoir. The height of the theoretical dam is therefore reduced to 224 meters. MICA Dam stands at 240 meters and produces 2 gigawatts of power. There are thousands of miles of ocean with equally as great a potential. OTEC, or Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, is the method by, by which this potential is converted to work. It was first proposed by a French physicist in 1881 as a means of providing useful energy. All efforts to tap its potential, however, have run up against the problem of massive movements of water to overcome the thermodynamic inefficiency of the process. Engineers will tell you you need a high delta T to produce power efficiency. With high delta T, however, you also get high entropy, and these systems will destroy the oceans as assuredly as climate change is already doing. As discussed earlier, to produce small 60 terawatts with fission or fusion, you end up with 450 terawatts being added to the oceans every year. Whereas with OTEC, you net out at 270 terawatts, an improvement of 180 terawatts over half of what we are currently accumulating. Conventional OTEC requires massive pipes and massive surface platforms to support them. Cold water pipes of 10 meters in diameter by 1,000 meters long are required for a 500 megawatt conventional OTEC plant. The costs associated with moving the water plus biofouling and condensing surfaces are huge obstacles, and hurricanes have destroyed most of the early efforts. Impingement and entrainment of a marine life are inherent in any mechanical movement of such massive volumes of water. It has also been suggested massive upwelling of cold water to promote aquaculture has the potential to release more CO2 than the burning of all the world's hydrocarbons and the potential to eutrophy the water column in the same manner as agricultural runoff from the Mississippi has created the Gulf of Mexico dead zones. Smalley suggests we need as much as 60 terawatts, but to produce one terawatt of energy with OTEC, you have to move 20 terawatts worth of heat from the hot to the cold reservoir. 60 terawatts therefore requires a transfer of 1.2 petawatts of power, which is the same amount of heat that drives the thermal ha haline circulation vital to global weather patterns. A heat pipe is a device for rapidly transferring heat using the phase changes of liquid. Heat required to evaporate the working fluid at the hot end equals the heat dissipated by the condensation of the fluid at the cold end. By inserting a turbine in such a system, you would, could, could produce 60 terawatts of energy by removing 120 terawatts of heat from the surface and dumping 60 terawatts to the depths. To produce 50 megawatts with such a system, you are required only to move 8 cubic meters of working fluid in, internally in a closed system as opposed to five, 400 cubic meters of water every second with a conventional approach. The 60 terawatts of heat transferred to the depths with such a two system would induce convection that would gently bring the nutrients phytoplankton require back to the surface. There would be minimal environmental impact or impact on the thermal hairline circulation. The effectiveness of a heat pipe stems from the use of phase changes of the working fluid. The heat of vaporization greatly exceeds the sensible heat capacity of a liquid. For example, the energy needed to evaporate one gram of water is 540 times the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of the same gram by one degree centigrade. 
The latent heat of evaporation is rapidly transferred from the hot end of the pipe to the cold where the vapor condenses and the latent heat of condensation is dispersed to the cold reservoir. The rate of movement of the vapor can approach the speed of sound. The system has no moving parts. The driver for the rapid movement of vapor is the pressure drop at the condensing end. With a conventional heat pipe, the condensed fluid returns to the evaporator end through a wick. To move the fluid 100 meters back to the surface in an OTEC system, however, would require pumping. This is an AutoCAD rendering of such a system, which also utilizes a countercurrent heat flow system to recapture and return the latent heat of condensation of the working fluid back to the surface. This would not only maintain the maximum Carnot efficiency by keeping the difference in temperature between the cold and hot reservoirs as great as possible, it would maximize the ocean's energy potential. No matter how hot the oceans may become, unless there is a cold reservoir into which this heat can be moved, there is no c capacity to produce power. Countercurrent heat flow systems are widely used in nature to transfer oxygen to, to the bloodstream in a fish's gills and to conserve body heat and fluids. Nature is the best analogy in many cases. Her response to an overheating ocean is a hurricane which is effectively an atmospheric heat pipe because it transfers heat rapidly through phase changes. OSTEC essentially turns the hurricane on its head. Each major hurricane can move between 50 and 200 terawatts of heat. The world currently operates on about 16 terawatts of primary energy. On average there are 21 major storms a year and many smaller storms. It is clear, therefore, that the oceans are capable of producing all of the energy we need, provided we turn the bulk of the energy in the form of latent heat of condensation back to the surface, just as a hurricane does in the form of rain. In the process of producing this energy, we could replace fossil fuels and reverse the buildup of damaging ocean heat. OTEC is the only form of energy production that addresses both the cause and effect of climate change.